Second <laughs> Samuel chapter five. Second Samuel chapter five. Right after First Samuel. Second Samuel chapter five. Let's go somewhere this morning. We've been talking about David, King David, for for uh, months. Actually, it started even back before Mother's Day, and uh, and I thought about this this passage here. It's an unusual passage, but I was talking with Pastor Kenneth, who's over in, in the Deritter. Uh, singer area in Louisiana. I talked with my pastor this morning, and I brought this up. It takes years to reach the city in which we are planted. And there are churches that have been here since the founding of this community. I actually meet with a lot of those pastors. Some merely exist while others bring impact. When I was commissioned to come here over 30 years ago, it was our intention not only to affect, but to to see a spiritual and physical change in this community, and I have seen it. Joshua and the Israelites marched around Jericho 13 times. We know that. Without saying a word till the last lap on the seventh day, and they shouted, and the walls came down. When I read that, I realized that the principle there was the issue was to stay obedient to God, to know when to be quiet, and when to take it by violence. The scripture says the violent take it by force. There's sometimes in our prayer life, in our movements, I was meeting yesterday with, uh, we have 70 something uh, Orthodox. I still don't know. It's, it's, they're Protestant though. Orthodox, uh, not Catholic, are they? It's a branch off the Catholic. They're from everywhere, all over Houston. And uh, they're uh, mainly from India, uh, the people really wonderful, respectful group. But I was talking to one of the priests. They wear these uh, dresses, Greek Orthodox type. Yeah, they wear a long uh, uh, robe dress. And one of them looked at me. He's from Detroit, Michigan. He said, it's hot down here. And I thought to myself, well, if you take that dress off, you'd feel a lot warmer or a lot cooler, you know. But I didn't say it. I was, I was nice. And I, I, I was chatting with them, and we were talking about the, the growth and how churches uh, are going and how they're growing uh, to reach a city, to reach a community. We got to ask ourselves, what do we got to go through to do it? And when I first came to Crosby, that was a part of my my drive, Kenny. I remember uh, I started a, a church just a little ways from a feed store where you were at. I don't think you even liked me then. Uh, I got stuck out on some property there, and you had to come pull me out, and I could tell there was a disdain about you, like, I don't like this preacher, and I didn't care, because <laughs> I still bought feed from you, and I still liked you, you know, until God made the change. What my, you weren't my problem. I was yours. <laughs> and the city began to shift, and we began to see great things happen around here, and we'll continue to do that. 2 Samuel chapter 5, it's around 1000 B.C. David has been made king. He's 30 years old. He's taken out a giant. He's taken out Philistines. He's become an armor bearer for King Saul. Now King Saul's dead. His covenant brother, Jonathan, is dead, and he has become king. Jerusalem is shut up tight by a group known as Jebusites. They are heathen, they are taunting, they are wicked, and David knows that that is the place, the seat, which will soon be known as the city of David. Second Samuel 5 says, Then all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron, and they told him, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, when Saul was our king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord told you, you will be the shepherd of my people Israel, and you will, and you will be Israel's leader. Verse 3, so there at Hebron, King David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel. So now David was anointed as a teenager to be king. But I've often used the term post-dated. Does everybody know what a post-dated check is? When you write a check and say this check is only good on this date, because I don't have the money in the bank yet, but you hold on to this check, because eventually it's going to be good. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all have all wrote them. 
David had a post-dated anointing. Amen. He was king, but it was going to be 15 years later that the check was going to be good. Now the check's good. Now he's on his second anointing. Amen. David was anointed three times. Just let me throw this at you real quick. Uh, Samuel anointed him as, as king as a, as a teenager. Amen. The people in Hebron as friends anointed him as king. But later on, David has a little baby that dies. And the Bible says he anointed himself. There are times in life people will anoint you and lift you up and make you uh, over something and bless you to do something. Then other friends will come along and anoint you or remind you, you know, God has been good to you. you really, but then there are times ain't nobody around. Ain't nobody going to be, uh, you, they, you can't get them on the phone, you can't get a text back. Nobody around. You got to anoint yourself. And you got to remind yourself, encourage yourself in the Lord and keep on pressing. The second anointing here that we realize that David has, verse 4 says, David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years and all. So you understand he was 70 when he, he reigned up to that time. He had reigned over Judah from Hebron for seven years, six months. And from Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. Now, he's not in Jerusalem yet. Verse 6 tells us how he gets there. David then led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites. The original inhabitants of the land who were living there, the Jebusites taunted David. You'll never get in here. Even the blind and the lame could keep you out. How are you going to tell a, a, a man who's 30, who's done took out Philistines, who's done took out a Goliath, who took out a lion, who took out a bear, that even the blind and the lame can stop you from getting in here? You don't taunt a man like that. You don't dare a man like that. You, you don't, it ain't going to happen. So they began to taunt David. For the Jebusites thought they were safe because they were in a fortified city. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the city of David, which is modern-day Jerusalem. On the day of the attack, David said to his troops, I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. Whoever attacks them should strike by going into the city through the water tunnel. That is the original saying. The blind and the lame may not enter the house. So David made the fortress his home, and he called in the city. He called it the city of David. He extended the city, starting at the support terraces and working toward verse 10. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord God of heaven's armies were with him. The key verse here, and I'll read it out of the Webster's Bible in verse 8, says, And David said on that day, whoever gets up the gutter and smites the Jebusites and the lame and the blind, that are hated by David's soul, he's going to be the chief and the captain. Therefore, they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Who gets up the gutter? Whoever defeats them becomes the commander of my army. We'll talk about who that's going to be in a minute. It was that, it was a pipe. It was a, it was a large pipe. Every one of you who has a home has a sewer pipe. you got something, and it's probably pretty small, but it's hidden so nobody sees it. Nobody wants to see your sewer. No one wants to smell your sewer. But in the city of that day, when I was a kid, we had no indoor plumbing, which means we had an outhouse. If you went behind our house, you saw uh, a porta potty. But it was made out of wood, and it had two holes in it, big hole, little hole. Big hole for big butts, little hole for little butts. All right? And it was way out there where nobody, you couldn't smell it so bad. It was it's the way I was raised. We didn't have indoor plumbing. We had a well. We drew water up in a bucket. We brought it in the house. And as I got older, we actually had a tub in the house with no plumbing in it. We had a sink in the house with no plumbing in it. We would bring water into the house. We'd heat it on a stove and put it in, and that's how you washed. In the summertime, the water ran off the house into a double tub, and we would bathe outside. I remember my mother giving us a bar of soap in the rain and said, go outside and take a shower. You hear me? I'm, I'm letting you know that I was raised country. We didn't have a sewer in the house. I remember when my dad built a, a, a septic tank out of center blocks, and he dug a hole, and he, he said, and I rem, as a kid, I'm thinking, what in the world is this about? But dad was excited that we're going to have indoor plumbing. And my brother and I's bedroom became the bathroom. Uh-huh. And it had a little slanted top on it, and, that's, and they moved us into another room, and they made that into the one of, most wonderful thing in the world, to stay in the house instead of going outside through the, through, through the trail to get to the outhouse. Now, I, I'm, I know this may sound vulgar to some of you, 
But when we were kids, we had a pea pot. Yeah. I still got my granny's. It's, it's a white porcelain pot with a red ring around it. Yeah, that, and you slid it under. But my granny and them, they had an indoor bathroom. It was a chair <laughs> with the pot underneath it. I thought, that's smart. That's a smart pot. Yeah. And then you had, the, back in the day, they called it a, a chamber pot. I'm teaching y'all right now. Uh-huh. I'm bringing you back. Some of you going way back. So in this city where the Jebusites were, they had a sewer pipe, a gutter, in one scripture called it, a water, another one called it. But the literal, the word there was a sand rot in the Hebrew language. It was a sand rot, which we get our word sanitation that allowed the sewage to be deposited. So they had one pipe that ran, and literally it would be almost as round in such a pipe that a man could crawl through it. And they threw uh, sewage, all their sewage went in it, all the rotten food went in it, all the uh, corpses that they didn't want to bury went in it. These were heathen people that sacrificed children, aborted babies. They would throw down in it. It was a sewer of filth and nasty. And, and the Jebusites taunted David and said, you'll never get in here. You'll never get in this city. You can't do it. Let me tell you, pretty won't win a city. I'm going to say it again. Pretty won't win a city. You can get pretty. You got pretty buildings. You have all kinds of stuff. But pretty ain't going to win a city. If you're going to win people to Jesus, you're going to have to crawl through some stuff. And the scripture says that the men of David began to crawl through that sewer. They went up and through. So how, how are you going to win a city that's taunting you? How are you going to turn things around? How are you going to shift? First, you've got to find an opening. You've got to have an opportunity. You can't th throw rocks at it. We just need an, an opening. You gotta, sometimes you've got to create one. These were not large pipes, just big enough for a man to move through. In the Old Testament, you know, have you ever seen Fear Factor? You remember Fear Factor? I, I remember watching that show they'd have this this uh, 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 plexiglass coffin and they'd lay somebody in there and they'd just pour spiders all over them and I'd watch it and I'd go Ooh. now I ain't so scared of spiders I ain't so scared of snakes I ain't so scared of a whole lot of stuff but they but but some of that stuff they do on that fear factor they'd hang you over a cliff or you'd walk out on things or it's all kind of things to scare you I'll tell you what I don't like I don't like sharks because I don't swim fast enough. Amen. I can tell you this, though. I can outrun a shark. <laughs> but I can't outswim one. So this is like an Old Testament fear factor that they've got to, to deal with. Listen, crawling through. Whatever was not wanted was thrown into those pipes. Stuff that others deem not necessary. And sometimes in life, church, you've got to crawl through some stuff if you want to take a city. They had pagan worship going on. They had all kinds of things that are happening. And I pray our hearts become soft and troubled as we move through the sewer to win this city and this community. And as for the, the disabled, even the disabled, I thank God, you know, I, I, my sister was this way, and I understand... I thank God for the betterment of their treatment. I thank God that they have a, uh, uh, that we've blessed them. As a youth pastor, I remember in the day there was a young girl that came, a Hispanic girl that was a part of our youth group, and I, I observed she wore black all the time. She had black baggy uh, T-shirts, uh, rock and roll shirts, and, and, and as, she, as she stayed in the youth group, she got bigger and bigger, and then she came to me one day, and she told me, she said, Pastor, I'm pregnant, 16 years old. She said, I'm pregnant, I, I, should I abort this baby? I said, baby, don't, don't, don't let it go. You know, I, I, somehow, some way, I believe God's going to do something. She said, will you take this child? I said, yeah, I will. I didn't have no children at the time. I said, I'll take that baby. And I remember when, as this thing moved on, and there are times Life can look ugly. There are times that it looks messed up. There's times that you feel like you're crawling through a sewer to try to help people. And, and I remember dealing with her parents, and she decided to keep that child. Now, listen, I, I, that was 30-something years ago. Did you know that about, about 15, 20 years ago, a young girl came up to me, and she said, I know you don't know me, but you were almost my daddy. That's happened twice to me when I've encouraged people, keep the child, bless the child. 
Love the child. Don't throw that child down the sewer. Can I get an amen? Amen. You know, how much are you willing to crawl through? Little boy was told by, by a man, he said, I want you to go. Inside. Last night I got stuck watching Yellowstone. It was McKenna's fault. She came over to the house. He said, would you watch? Let's watch Yeltsin. So I kicked it on, and I thought, oh, I really like this show. The neat thing is I could fast forward through all the drama and the nonsense to that redheaded girl on there. But I got to a certain part where a little boy was, was up in there, and one of the things they, that Rip told him, he said, go in there and start shoveling all the manure. That was his first job, shoveling manure. And I thought about the little boy that had to go shovel manure. And he went in there, and he started shoveling, and he was smiling as he shoveled that manure. And the, and the man looked at him. He said, son, why are you smiling while you're shoveling all this manure? He said, because I know if I keep shoveling this manure, he said, with all this manure, there's got to be a Shetland pony in here somewhere. <laughs> amen. Sometimes in life, you just keep shoveling until you find a pony. Can I get an Amen. There have been sacrifices for the gospel we enjoy. This generation needs to respect the sacrifices of the past that got us to where we are, the missionaries, the pastors, other believers that gave up so much to build the houses of God in this area. The little country church started through uncomfortable seasons, minimum finances, misunderstandings. We cowboyed with the best of them. We rode scooters with the roughest of them. Our members at times would scare most congregations. We crawled through some stuff to get here. We did muscle car Sundays. Why did we do that? It wasn't the prettiest thing to do. We've been doing it for 20 something, actually longer than that in my life, but we started a car show to reach misfits. It wasn't just about having a, a worship and another service outside. We wanted to reach people. See, a lot of times people start churches, and you know what happens, and I've seen it in this community. All the people from other churches go to this church, and then they go to that church. They, I want to reach people that don't know Jesus. Amen. Connect with them. Hang out with them. Amen. That's what we're here to do. And if you're here and God planted you here, stay here with me until we crawl through some stuff to reach people that have taunted us and laughed at us and said, y'all ain't pretty. No, we know we ain't pretty. But God loves us. Amen. And that's enough for us. Can I get an Amen. amen. Second, how do you win a city? Second, you've got to free up the leaders. That's what, Joseph, that's what uh, King David did. He said, I, I, I'm going to let the leaders go. Whoever gets in there first, I'm going to make the commander. By the time David ruled, he had 300,000 warriors, 1,200 commanders. We need the kind of people who will get angry at a pretty city. We need people that say, you know what? I know it's pretty right here, but I'm, I'm going to go after it. Well, listen to me. Whatever makes you angry, mad, Oh, I ain't done yet. Sit down. Here. No, that's good. I like that. Now, I, I, that's good. I like that. Because we got a long way before I finish. You, you're wonderful. I like you. I didn't know where that was coming from. I got to get used to this. But I'm going to tell you something. I can get used to this. I like a little atmosphere. Whatever makes you angry, mad, often can lead you to enter the sewer. When you find your problem, you found your purpose. You got to find your problem. Somebody say, I got too many problems. Find your problem. Find your problem. When my wife was going through cancer. We started bringing hats to cancer patients, wigs to bless them. We found a problem. We found a purpose. Whenever I start stumbling around because of this thing that's inside my body I was born with, I found a problem. It makes me want to reach and connect with other handicaps, other people that struggle and tell you, quit belly aching. Do what you can do. Do what you can do. You may not be able to, I can't run, but I can walk fast. Amen. I can still do a lot of stuff. You, you got to get, when I got arrested for protesting against abortion, it's because I had a problem. I didn't have no children. I saw teenagers get pregnant. And I said, God, they were my teenagers that were coming in, misfits coming in. And I said, God, we, Pastor, you remember this stuff back in the day. And I, I saw God do, I had a problem. So I started standing up for the babies. Next thing I know, God started giving me children. Hallelujah. I got problems. So wherever your problem is, you find your purpose in life. Amen. God gave us a camp. Why would God give us a camp? Because we love kids. 
We love kids. And we watch God touch them. I, I saw Tammy Lovely post this morning a picture of her son and her son who passed. They were all part of the camp. All part of the camp. Amen. God gave us that. Did you know that in the in the eight in in the nineties, the early nineties, I drove out to that camp when I was pastoring the church here in Crosby. And I drove through there with my pastor and I got stuck. And they had pulled me out with a tractor. Kenny, it seemed like I always getting stuck. And 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 I looked at the lady that owned the camp and I said, We'd like to buy this camp. And she said, Okay. And she put my name on the paperwork that I was gonna buy that camp. And then I went through one of the hardest times of my life when I left the church that I pastored here. And I ended up at that camp. She called me and said, come to this camp and, and, and be the, the leader here at this camp. I showed up broken. I had a problem. And God gave me purpose. And then she looked at me, and they were going to sell that camp for $2 million. 110 acres are going to sell for $2 million to a Hispanic group. And she looked at me, and she said, do you want to camp? Your name's on the list. You're the only guy that can buy this camp, according to the realtor, because your name was on it years ago. I agreed to sell it to you. I said, how much you want? She said, a million two. We had 70 people. 70 people. Our first offering was a dollar. I kept it. 70 people. A million two. I said, sound like a God, a job for God. We'll crawl through this sewer. We'll take it. Now it's paid off. This place is paid off. God's been good to us. Why? Because we dared to crawl through the sewer. We kept pressing through it. Amen. We found our problem. Well, why, why, did, why did we were on the tower? Joseph and I were on the tower. And, and this, these young people came up there and they said, uh, What's your name? I always ask them their name. I said, I'm Pastor Jerry. They said, you're the pastor? I said, yeah. What are you doing on this tower? I said, I'm throwing your butt off. I said, hey, that's Pastor Joseph. He's my associate. What's he doing on this tower? We're volunteers. We love doing this. We want you to overcome fear. We want you to have a good time. Amen. This is why we're here. It's, it's, not, it's not about making money. Amen. I don't think we've ever made money on it. Amen. But it's what we enjoy doing. And we see their smiles and we see God changing them. Amen. Luke chapter 4 tells me that Jesus, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the church as was his custom. And he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet. He was 12 years old at this time. And they handed him the prophet of Isaiah. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovered of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, Jesus was saying, I didn't come here to reach all the pretty, all the ones that already helped, all the ones that are already good. I'm here to help those that need a doctor. Amen. I'm looking for the bankrupt and the brokenhearted and the bound with addictions and the blind spiritually and the bruised. It ain't pretty, but you got to keep moving through the pipe. And he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant he sat down and the eyes of all the church were fastened on him the people we will reach may not seem acceptable to some but by his grace he changed us all can I get an amen we need to free people motivated by a cause committed to the king if we get a glimpse of hell if you get a glimpse of hell if you understand that eternity is long if you can just taste the flames of hell when you see people that have been killed and, and hurt and, and abused and stolen from, it should make us willing to crawl through whatever to win the city. Listen, I've gone through enough that separated me from friends for a period of time, even from my family. When I got born again and I went to Bible college, the whispers back home in Alabama were, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You're telling me that Hovada wants to be a preacher? Uh, he's the one that got us in trouble. We went to jail because of him. We wrecked our car because of him. You kidding me? I have heard it before. But this I believe. When people really understand the will of God for your life, it's worth the fight. John 10, 10 says, Jesus said, I come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. I believe that. We need healing. 
from broken hearts and bruised identities, reaching to the less fortunate, reminding the proud that humility equals strength. We need to serve like Jesus. We need to be healing agents to those that are brokenhearted. You got to finish the course. How are you going to win the city? We got to finish. We got we to stay after it. We got to keep moving. Once you're halfway through the pipe, don't back up. You done got stuff in your shirt, in your shorts. You done got stuff all up in you. Don't turn around and back up. There are people trying to get through. They're waiting on you. Keep pressing through the pipe. Can I get an amen? Don't, don't, don't start backing up now. Amen. You've done gone through, 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 through too, too much. When I went through one of the most difficult times in my life, I had people tell me, well, you know, you can sell your sermons. You can sell shoes. You can sell roofs. You can sell. Listen, I've done gone through too far up this pipe. I ain't backing up now. Amen. I've been at this thing for 40 years. I've been crawling through some stuff. Amen. Misunderstandings and gossips and criticism. I'm coming up through the pipe. Amen. I ain't backing up now. Second Timothy 4, Peter said, I'm oh, sorry. Paul said, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've been through the pipe. That's what Paul's saying. I've been through the pipe. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. I, this has happened to me. Amen. I finished my course. I kept my faith. I, I've been through it. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all those who love his appearing. I'm glad he said to all of us. We're looking forward to his, his appearing. Pastor, how do you win a city? When you finally get to the city, you got to fight. you got to stay with him. Our fight is through prayer. Our fight is through fasting. Our, our fight is through giving. Our, our fight is through witnessing, being a witness, evangelizing. I told this uh, uh, Orthodox guy, he said, tell me about your church. I said, well, we're not, we don't have a denomination on us. We're just a group of believers, amen, with a strong desire to reach people for Jesus. When you finally get to the city, you've got to go through it to get to it. Though you're tired, Pastor, I've been there a long time. I know, I know you have. I know you're tired, but you've got to fight. We've got to have a little fight left. So Chronicles tells us chapter 11, that there was a man. David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem. That is Jebus. The Jebusites who lived there said to David, you will not get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress, which is the city of David. David had said, whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become commander-in-chief. Joab. Joab. You'll read Joab all through Scripture. I think Joab was a muscular big man. He, he just hung out with David. He was an armor bearer to David. He loved David. And so as soon as he heard the word, first guy gets in there, he's going to be my commander. Get out of my way. I'm going through that sewer. Amen. And he, you can imagine the Jebusites as old, old, Jeb, old Joab pumped up out of there. He got, he got all kind of crap hanging on him. Sometimes you got to go through the crap. Can I get an amen? He stuck when he come up out of there. Hallelujah. He got his sword with him. He got all the men with him. And all them Jebusites said, man, if they're willing to do that to win this city, you can have this place. Did you know they didn't kill any of the Jebusites? The Jebusites converted over to be with David and the Israelites. And they made the city a greater city after this time. And David took up residence in the fortress, and so it was called the city of David. He built up the city around it from the terraces to the surrounding walls. Amen. We need to prove to our king who chose us that we will do whatever it takes. They did not kill the Jebusites, but they put them in their place. If more believers in this community, this city, stood together for the things of God in our, in, in, you know, the things of God, we'd see more salvations. We see more people turn to Christ. We see righteousness in the cities. Amen. We wouldn't have the nonsense we got going on in Houston. And soon God will give us another opening. You got to be angry about people going to hell. Every time I go to a funeral, I say, I look around and think, man, God, please make sure these people understand. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. We, we got to know you. Jesus' first public words was, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. To reach the bankrupt, brokenhearted, bound, blind, bruised. It ain't pretty, but keep moving through the pipe. Luke 14, and I close with this parable. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Do you understand? We're going to eat in heaven. How many of you don't enjoy eating? 
much what I thought. I mean, we think about it. Amen. We just like, enjoy. And God said, yeah, I'm not going to take that away from you when you get to heaven. We're going to eat when we get there. Amen. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet. He invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. They ain't nothing like having somebody fix a meal for you. They done fixed it. You got the turkey and the ham and the giblet gravy. You got the yeast rolls and the cranberry sauce. Everything fixed. Great banquet's already been done. But they all alike began to make excuses. Well, it's 4th of July weekend. I ain't going to church. Hmm. See, the banquet is the church. It's where the family of God gathers. First said, I, I, I just bought a field, and I got to go see it. Who buys land that ain't seen it yet? Who buys land that ain't seen it yet? I, I'm, I'm in the book of Luke. I don't know if I put that on the overhead or not, Luke 14. But he said, I, I bought some land. I got to go see it. Please excuse me. Dumb excuse. Another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Last thing, I will never buy a vehicle online that I ain't drove. I'm going to test drive it. This guy got oxen. He said, I got to go check them out. That's his dumb excuse. These are just excuses. We use them all the time. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just married, so I can't come. Well, you need to bring her. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry. That's God. And ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, bring in the crippled, bring in the blind, bring in the lame, bring in the misfits, bring them in. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but we still got room. We still got room. Verse 23, then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. One scripture says, go to the highways and the byways. Go find them in the gutter. Bring them to the udder. That was good preaching. Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited, who had excuses, will get a taste of my banquet. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. God, help us understand and spiritually see that we've been through the pipe. We've moved through some things to reach this city, but we ain't done yet. Help us to press through and invite, to connect, to reach, to understand it ain't about us. It's about others. Help us find a problem that will lead us to our purpose. Connect us, God, with the things of heaven. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you've been away from Jesus, can I pray for you? If you've been away from Jesus, can I pray for you? All you got to do is slip your hand up and I'll pray for you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Can I pray for you? Anyone else can lift your hand right now. I I'll pray for you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. I believe this. In the name of Jesus. Those hands that are lifted. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to touch their lives. Would you pray this with me, Lord Jesus? I've been through the pipe. I've been through some stuff. I've been through far to come back now. Forgive me of my sins. Turn my life around. Be my Savior, my Lord, and my King. And I give you praise that I'm a part of the banquet in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God praise in this house. Yes. Been through the pipe, man. Been through the pipe. Pretty won't win the city. We got to do something for God. Amen. Amen. Wherever God puts you, I don't care if it's Fairfield, Kennefick, or where he puts you. God wants to turn your life around. He wants to change some things in you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Sweet. You like that, young? Okay. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up, so many folk out of town. Good to have you guys here. Good to have you back, Robert. Amen. I saw your daughter get on the bus. Thank God. No, it wasn't you. It was another one. 
heart. There's a girl who looks just like you got on the bus. Oh, you got on the bus? You came home? Okay. I still love you. You got to ride the bus? Amen. Did you die? You're here? Amen. No, it works. It works. It works. It looks it matches your beard. You're tithing off envelopes in front of you. To reach the city, it takes finances. You know that. To do what we do. There, there are places uh, we got to do. We got to do work on this building. We got to work on the other. We got so much stuff ahead of us. I just ask God to help us to find the right dominoes to knock down as we move forward. But I want you to pray for our teenagers this week. God touches their life. Amen. And there'll be a shift in them, a spiritual shift and within our church. We're not done with Crosby yet. This community is growing. Man, is it growing. It's grown all the way out through Huffman and Dayton and, and Channel View and, and, and Itascacita. And, and then we got all this in between. And we need wisdom as we grow as a, as a group of believers. Miss Dolly, happy birthday again. How, may I ask you, how old are you? Unbelievable. The 4th of July. I say that because I know on the 4th of July, her, her dad said all in fireworks is because it's your birthday. I thought that that's cute, man. He got away with that for years. Uh, as we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. Give Pastor Joseph a hand as he comes.